I'll introduce our uh, panelists in just a moment, but let me just do just a little bit of stage setting. Dignitatis Humanae is the Latin title for the Roman Catholic Church's Declaration on Religious Liberty. The Latin means, of course, the dignity of the human person, which gives you a sense immediately of what the church is arguing. Uh, of the 16 documents that came out of the Second Vatican Council, this was by far the most contentious, and it remains so to this day, although the ground of contention may have shifted. While there's probably less disagreement among Catholics over the normative value of dignitatis to the church and the world, there remain strong differences over the meaning of the religious freedom embraced in that document and how it emerged within the Catholic tradition. We've assembled three highly accomplished Catholic scholars to discuss some of these disagreements and perhaps engage in some of those disagreements themselves. The great American Jesuit John Courtney Murray, who contributed himself so much to Dignitatis, and I have no doubt will be invoked many times today, once pointed out that what we call disagreement is sometimes merely confusion. Confusion is something to be avoided. Principal disagreement is an achievement, and I would add uh, it's necessary, a necessary achievement for the proper functioning of a democracy. So let's proceed. We're going to begin with each panelist speaking for eight to ten minutes, followed by a discussion among us here on the stage, and then I'll be sure to leave some time to engage you in the audience uh, uh, yourselves. Now, I put three questions to our panelists just as a general starting point. They'll handle it in different ways themselves. Let me just tell you what those questions were. First, what was the central teaching of Dignitatis with respect to religious freedom? Second, to what extent was Dignitatis approached to religious freedom in continuity? with established church teaching, and to what extent did it mark a new departure? And finally, and in some ways to me the most enticing, how is it relevant to contemporary controversies surrounding religious liberty in the United States and around the world? I'm going first from, uh, from my left and your left to right will be Father John O'Malley, a Jesuit priest and university professor in the Department of Theology here at Georgetown. Next, we'll hear from Lisa Cahill, J. Donald Monin, professor in the Department of Theology at Boston College. Last will be Gerald Bradley, a professor of law at Notre Dame Law School. You have their bios and uh, some of their tremendous accomplishments, uh, accomplishments in, in the agendas before you. So, Father O'Malley. Thank you. I'm going to read what I have here. Um, I think my task is basically to uh, sort of set the stage for what's coming. So. Uh, I'm going to tell you a lot of things you probably know, but at least it, we get the, the basic uh, facts and sort of scenario out on the table right away. <clears throat> the issue of church-state relationships originated in the early fourth century when the Emperor Constantine convoked the Council of Nicaea, which he treated as if it were the ecclesiastical equivalent of the Roman Senate. Not only did he convoke the council, but he committed himself to implement the council's decrees as the law of the land. From that time forward, a reciprocally helpful, but fragile and often contentious partnership developed, which persisted in a wide variety of forms up to the 16th century. When in that century it became clear that Protestantism was here to stay, the principle of cuius regio eius religio was applied in both Catholic and Protestant lands and resulted in what we know as established churches in confessionally committed states. In those states, one religious confession was privileged above all others to the point that the others might be illegal or at least subject to severe civil disabilities. Although the French Revolution swept away in Catholic lands this marriage of church of throne and altar, the popes of the 19th and early 20th centuries tried to reinstate it whenever and wherever possible. As part of the heritage of the Enlightenment, however, a new problem had emerged advocacy of religious liberty and freedom of conscience, to use the shorthand expressions. In 1831, Pope Gregory XVI denounced these principles as an absurdity and as the beginning of the end of right order in society. Subsequent popes followed suit, but sometimes with qualifications. In the 1950s, on the eve of Vatican II, the Supreme Congregation of the Holy Office of the Inquisition, under Cardinal Alfredo Ottaviani, insisted that the confessional state was the ideal and sought its implementation in concordats with Spain, Portugal, and other countries. In these confessional states, circumstances might warrant a certain toleration for other churches, but might also warrant imposing civil disabilities, especially prohibiting public cult. 
The paradox here is that the leaders of the Christian democratic movement after World War II were Catholics. De Gasperi in Italy, Adenauer in Germany, and de Gaulle in France, all of whom subscribed to the principle of religious liberty. Within the ranks of Catholic thinkers, moreover, Jacques Maritain in France, Pietro Pavan in Italy, and John Courtney Murray in the United States mounted arguments in favor of liberty that brought them into conflict with the Holy Office. Ottaviani was head of the Preparatory Doctrinal Commission for the Council. And as late as June 1962, the Council opened in October of that year, the draft of the church state section of the decree of that commission on the church allowed that a Catholic state could legitimately put restrictions on the practice of other confessions. This section was dropped from the draft finally presented to the Council six months later on December the 1st, 1962. Early the next year, the Council relocated the church state issue, removing it from Ottaviani's commission and consigning it to the Secretariat for Christian Unity under Cardinal Augustine Bea. Meanwhile, in April, just two months before his death, Pope John XXIII published his encyclical Pacem in Terris, ghost written in part by Pavan, in which he asserted the right of all human beings to freedom of religion, a position strikingly opposed to that of the Holy Office. The decree that eventually became Dignitatis Humanae was first briefly presented to the Council at the end of the second period, 1963, but did not hit the floor for discussion until September of the next year, where it met vehement opposition. Except for, perhaps, for Nostra Aetate, no other document had such a difficult time making it through the Council, as we heard, so much so that at one point the Secretariat considered withdrawing it altogether. The fact that between June 1962 and November 1965, it went through 12 drafts more than suggests how difficult the course was. <clears throat> the arguments against it. It contradicts the clear and repeated teaching of the popes since Gregory XVI. It was contrary to the practice of the church. It was a novelty. It fostered religious indifferentism. It exalts conscience over the doctrine over the, to the detriment of obedience. It was based on principles of liberalism, Americanism, and modernism, heresies many times condemned by the Holy See. It might perhaps be appropriate for so-called Protestant countries, but was inapplicable in those with a Catholic tradition, and it cannot therefore be raised to the dignity of a universal principle. The strongest and unrelenting opposition came from the group of bishops led by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, later founder of the Society of St. Of Pius X. That society still denounces it. As we all know, Dignitatis Humanae, in fact, received approval. The warm, sometimes almost desperate support given it by bishops from behind the Iron Curtain tipped the scales in its favor. In the crucial vote in September 1965, only 224 out of some 2,100 bishops voted against it, a majority of roughly 90%. In the final formal vote at the end of the council, it received only 70 negative votes, principally from bishops gathered around the FEB. What does Dignitatis Humanae say? Here it is best, perhaps, to quote the crucial paragraph, quotation. The Vatican Council declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. Freedom of this kind means that everyone should be immune from coercion by individuals, social groups, and every human power, so that within due limits, no men or women are forced to, to act against their convictions, nor are any persons to be restrained <clears throat> from acting in accordance with their convictions in religious matters, in private or in public, alone or in association with others. The Council further declares that the right to religious freedom is based on the very dignity of the human person as known through the revealed word of God and by reason itself. This right must be given such recognition in the constitutional order of society as will make it a civil right." End of quotation. The document justifies its teaching by saying it intends to develop the teaching of recent popes, evolvere intended. In fact, except for John XXIII, it contradicts the teaching of the popes. 
This is a good example of the euphemisms the council employed that helped get documents passed, but that have led since then to serious controversies. Nonetheless, a decent argument can be made, even in this case, for a kind of development. The more basic justification the document adduces, however, is a form of ressourcement, a going back to a more ancient and basic tradition in order to correct the present. In this case, the more ancient teachings were, first, the free character, the act of faith, and second, the fact that obedience to one's conscience is the norm to which everyone is held. Beyond those two fundamentals, the document argues that religious liberty is more in accord with the dignity of the human person, and especially the dignity of the Christian. So what? Well, first of all, dignitatis humani does mark, as was often said at the time of the Council, the end of the Constantinian era for the Catholic Church, the end of the era that began with the Council of Nicaea. More specifically, the document marked and constituted a role reversal for the Church. Instead of being the most prominent teacher of the legitimacy of religious repression, the Church now took its place among the teachers of the right to religious freedom. The document provided the Church, therefore, with a new message, a new mission, and a new job description, herald of a basic human right. Even before the Council ended, Pope Paul VI dramatized this 180-degree change when on November the 4th, 1965, he addressed the United Nations just after the Council had ratified Dignitatis Humanae by an overwhelmingly positive vote. In his address, he commended the UN for its dedication to human rights and especially the right to freedom of religion. Such a statement from a pope would have been inconceivable just four years earlier. Thank you. Okay, so now we're up to 1965 and Paul VI at the United Nations. Lisa, take it from there. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, let me say first of all that I am a Catholic moral theologian and a Catholic social ethicist, not a lawyer, not a historian, and not a politician. So That's I'm approaching this. Yeah, I'm approaching this from the standpoint of the effect of this discussion, especially on my field, which is Catholic social ethics. And I'm a great advocate of the public voice of the Catholic Church on that basis. So I have uh, like four or five points. I'm going to make them as quickly as I can. If I run out of time, just wave at me, and we'll leave it for the discussion. We'll fine. OK. So uh, the first thing uh, about Dignitatis Humanae to take away something that was really new, as John was just saying, is that it presents religious freedom as a human right. And it's the freedom not only to have the truth, such as was the older view in which error had no rights, it's also the freedom to seek the truth as the individual, the tradition, the organization, the church sees fit. So religious freedom now appears as a human right in a way which it never had before. My second point, though, and here we get closer to my own field, is that the basis of this right is really key. And the basis of the right is what we used to call natural law. I still like that term myself. And it has to do, as uh, number seven of Dignitatis Humanae uh, insists repeatedly, with the dignity of the person and the common good. Uh, that same paragraph of the document uses phrases such as the object of moral order undergirds the right to religious freedom. True justice, public morality, and public order. In a footnote that was authored by John Courtney Murray, public order is further specified as the minimal standards of public morality enforced for all. So the object of moral order is what uh, Catholic ethics and Catholic social teaching, of course, are based on. The object of moral order can be equated neither with a general public consensus, which of course can um, uh, uh, fail to conform to the object of moral order, nor is it to be equated with religious teaching, 
which is narrower. Both of those might be related to the object of moral order, and both of them, in fact, might be indicators of the direction in which that order lies. But object of moral order uh, means something a little different, and I would say not always a thing that's really easy to ascertain. I'll get back to that later, I hope. But it is the objective moral order and public order that establish the right to religious freedom and also limit that right. Also, inherent in this basis is a premise or affirmation of the natural law as the basis of the object of moral order. There was a later encyclical written by John Paul II called Redemptor Homines, which comments specifically on Dignitatis Humanae in uh, paragraph 17 and further builds out this idea of object of morality using these terms, human experience, reason, dignity, justice, the authentically human. This is what the object of order is about. My third point is that um, another takeaway from Dignitatis Humanae is that religious liberty is defined not only in terms of freedom from coercion, but also freedom from restraint in the practice of religion. And this, I believe, includes not only religious individuals, but also the national and international leadership of religious bodies, including the Vatican and its representatives and our Conference of Catholic Bishops. And we see that free exercise of religious conviction Again, uh, in the moral uh, order, based on objective uh, morality, reason, public order, and so on, expressed and motivating encyclicals such as John the Twenty-Third, Pachem and Terrace, Paul the Sixth, Popolorum Progressio, John the uh, Paul the Second, Solicitudo Rei Socialis, and Centesimus Annus, and of course Benedict the Sixteenth, Caritas and Veritate. And all of those have to do with national and international issues of the common good, human dignity, justice. There have also been papal and other ecclesial documents having to do not so much with what we, to me this is an erroneous division, but I'll communicate it quickly, you'll know what I mean. Not so much with social justice uh, uh, issues, but with life issues. So of course those are not separate. But to me, the most successful and influential public document of the church, so a document that had an impact on the public order in this regard, was Donum Vitae, which was uh, the Instruction on Reproductive Technologies. It was published in 1987. And it was in the middle of a big national and even international debate about the uh, morality and the proper restrictions or guidance of new reproductive technologies that were emerging all over the place and that were kind of getting out of control. In the United States, the stimulus to this was the Mary Beth Whitehead case. Uh, she was a surrogate mother. Uh, so that document, I think, um, not everyone agreed with all of its conclusions, but I think it usefully brought the ethical questions into the public sphere and uh, stimulated a lot of debate. Now, a question, so here I'm moving a bit to relevance for today. And I'm speaking very much from the heart as a Catholic uh, ethicist and theologian. Uh, when moral issues, which are ultimately grounded in the common good and the dignity of the person, are promoted and defended in our culture or any other culture on the basis of religious liberty, without due attention to the arguments on the basis of reason, human experience, and authentic humanity that can also be proposed in defense of those teachings, what does that do to our moral tradition and our public voice? And I will say that on many occasions, I have had the experience as a Catholic theologian of going into a pluralistic or, you know, if you will, secular, I'm not sure that truly secular is a category that really exists either, uh, but going into a pluralistic environment and being invited to speak and having people look at me with shock and surprise when I advocate Catholic social teaching or uh, you know, not really giving me much credibility when I try to point out some of the values within our tradition on sex, gender, and marriage. So a huge fear that I have or concern 
uh, is that we're not always doing justice to the merits of the arguments and promoting those in the best way that we can, accepting that we may not always be successful, or even in some cases, such as the teaching on religious liberty itself, okay, the, the moral view of the church will need to be adapted in some respects. Um, as a kind of footnote to this, so I've been promoting uh, natural law and the objective moral order as a basis for religious participation in the uh, public debate. But I do also want to add that I believe that it is appropriate sometimes to use specifically religious symbols, language, and narratives. If that is done in an invitational way, uh, in a way that's not excessively dogmatic, and in a way that appeals to people from other religious traditions to respond uh, with values uh, that resonate uh, between the two of us. Um, uh, you know, just as an example, tomorrow I'm going to be on another panel here at Georgetown launching a new book by Daniel Philpot on just peacemaking. And the other two panelists are a Jew and a Muslim. So that's an instance where we bring our religious tradition, we talk about matters of common concern, and we reach consensus, hopefully, on the dignity of the person and the common good. Okay, now a fourth um, uh, sort of topic that I'd like to bring up, and this could bear a lot of discussion, which I won't give it right this minute, but as we engage in this uh, process, in this call, this responsibility to public engagement of our faith tradition uh, about matters that impinge on objective morality and the requirements of the public order, we must acknowledge that there will be problems in gray areas. Okay, we don't have a lockdown on every argument about every item, particularly, as Thomas Aquinas said, the more we descend to matters of detail. As he pointed out, those matters of detail are contingent matters. There will not always be certainty, there will not always be agreement, and there will not always even be exactly the same right solution for every situation. In my opinion, the political discussion in this country is far too polarized. I uh, would hate to see our church or other religious uh, groups contribute to that polarization rather than attempting to bridge it. And, uh, you know, principal disagreements are one thing, but I think we have plenty of disagreements in our political atmosphere. What we need now are some bridges to be built. I personally do not believe that either Christian or Catholic religious liberty or reproductive rights are under serious threat in this country. Much more civil discussion is needed and we need to pursue what John Paul II called, as cited in our bishop's faithful citizenship, what John Paul II called the art of the possible. And he used that phrase actually in referring to abortion law. So um, I know that we have complicated matters out there, universal health care, the budget, uh, the nature and funding of uh, federal benefit programs, military policy, uh, measures to promote racial equality in education and employment. But the conversation needs to be had and the polarization needs to be reduced. Catholic social teaching and our responsibility to freely exercise our religion call us to be a force for the common good. And the gospel calls us to be a force for reconciliation. One final point that I will make, which is kind of off on another tangent, but it's about the definition of what is a religious institution. So obviously I've been looking at our Catholic tradition quite broadly as a religious institution that should have a voice in this society. Um, while I am a strong advocate of health care reform, and I do think there should be compromise on the HHS mandate, again, not to be discussed in detail right this minute. I also do believe that the HHS definition of a religious institution is too narrow. Okay, Catholic hospitals and Catholic universities are Catholic institutions. Um, I don't mean that to settle the question of whether they should have to fund uh, insurance that gives access to uh, contraceptive coverage. That, that's one of those other difficult issues that has to be negotiated. But certainly, from the Catholic standpoint, uh, our social mission is to work with others outside of our own tradition and to serve all. 
Um, so on that basis, again, I would call us simply to try to be a force uh, for civil conversation and to a better political atmosphere and a more healthy outcome in terms of public policy. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Lisa. I would, uh, before, before Jerry Bradley speaks, let me just mention the event that Lisa referred to tomorrow, uh, the Catholic Jew and the Muslim, is that the way it went, is uh, an event by, uh, sponsored by the Berkeley Center and the Religious Freedom Project, Dan Philpott, Dan, where are you? He, you'll, you'll see him later today uh, as one of our panelists, so thanks for mentioning that, thanks for that presentation. Now, Professor Bradley. Well, thanks, Tom. I think since this is, uh as I understand it, an event strictly from the Catholic perspective, I think we'll leave aside the punchline to the Jew, Muslim, and Christian joke. I know a very good one about Dominican or Franciscan and a Jesuit, uh, but I'll leave that for later. But uh, Thomas put a lot on our plates. Uh, he gave us three questions to consider. What's the central teaching of Dignitas Humanae or DH? What's new and what's not new? And its relevance to the contemporary world, America and beyond. Uh, I thank him for the confidence that he's exhibiting in each one of us by giving us such a, a big assignment. Uh, each one of those questions could and has called forth book-length treatments by others. Uh, and Tom, in a further display of confidence in us, has given us a whole eight to ten minutes to handle this. So I'll do the best yeah, I can. Which is already gone, Jerry. Yes, yeah, so, well, in <laughs> trying to be charming and clever, I've wasted one quarter of my time. But I'm going to try to cut to the chase as best I can. I, I think... It's pretty certain that the, the new part of Dignitas Humanae has to do with the public manifestation of, of non-Catholic religions, uh, and Dignitas Humanae affirms, I think unqualifiedly, uh, the right of all persons, no matter what their religion, to publicly profess, propagate, and manifest their religions in public and in private, as well as in groups and alone. And as far as Dignitas Humanae, says it's the same whether you're living in, you're a non-Catholic living in a Catholic or predominantly Catholic society or not. Now I think this, this is new, uh, and Ignatius Humanae I think is referring most of all to this new thing in its own paragraph 12, where perhaps in an example of a kind of benign expression that Father referred to in a different context earlier, where there's an, an attempt to keep up as much continuity as possible. But in Ignatius Humanae 12, the Council Fathers say that through its pilgrimage in history, there have been times when the church has acted in a way that's contrary to the spirit of the gospel. And I think that refers most of all to the treatment and violent suppression of non-Catholic religions. But nonetheless, in Dignitatis Humanae 12, the Fathers affirm that the doctrine, the teaching of the church has remained intact. Now, I think that there are many sources of this new thing, and I think it was at the time, but as the mid-60s, probably in the mainstream of the dominant stream or current of Catholic philosophical and theological thought. I think it was in the middle of elite opinion, Cardinal Taviani notwithstanding. And it has, I think, its deepest root in a norm or a truth that goes back to the gospel, which, of course, is that people must come to the gospel freely. And I think that notwithstanding Dignitatis Humanae 12, the church, its teachings, and its behavior by and large, through the centuries, in season and out, respected that truth, that people should not be forcibly baptized. Now, with regard to the freedom of people to leave the faith and to not be violently or coercively brought back to the faith, the treatment of heretics, apostates, there I think the matter is much more dark. Uh, the church has not respected, you might say, the freedom of persons to exit the faith that they've been baptized into at least once professed. And it is a long and dark history of suppression of heretics, apostates, and the suppression of non-Catholic believers. Nonetheless, I think if you look with as much care as you can muster at that tradition, if you will, of violent suppression of apostasy, heresy, and non-Catholic religions, I think it'll be difficult to identify very many instances where the suppression, which was wrong in any event, but where the suppression itself was meant precisely to bring persons back to the faith, in the case of heresy and apostasy, or to forcibly convert non-Catholics. I think there were other ends in view, uh, preventing scandal to those Catholics who remained in the population, 
uh, to kind of reunify the political order where the political order itself was understood to be a kind of Catholic political order, maybe to bring back the individual apostate or heretic to a Christian way of life. And of course, maybe the most often stated grounds in this regard was to make a person live up to their promises, promises made at baptism either individually or by the godparents in the case of infant baptism. <clears throat> but nonetheless, I think this is the core, the core of the Dingstash Humani. It's even the core explanation of what's new. And it goes back to, to Jesus. But I think that we can say a little bit more about what's new and what's more in Dingstash Humani. And here I'll turn to what I think is maybe most relevant or most pertinent, most important takeaway, as, as Lisa mentioned, from Dignitas Humane. And it's to look at, the, on the pages of Dignitas Humane, what's driving this recognition. And I think it's not difficult to see what's kind of driving um, this recognition of the rights of all persons to freedom from coercion. And it is not only the freedom with which persons should come to faith, but rather an increasing understanding and appreciation of the overriding importance that people do so. That is to say, from the front to the back of the Nitas Germane, but really I think woven all through the first half of it, the natural law part of it, if you will, you can see under the term of exigencies of human dignity or developing consciousness or increasing demands, I think when you look, you'll see that what centrally is being said there is that people have come to see that each one's authentic engagement with the search for truth, that each one appropriating what the one comes to believe is true and directing his or her life according to that truth, that simply has come to be appreciated as more important, more urgent, of greater value than, print, for example, stymieing an appearance of religious indifferentism or preventing scandal to the simple-minded faithful. So this is the new underwriter of religious freedom. And here, I think, the best example of what I'm trying to describe outside of the pages comes from what he was sent main intervention during the course of the discussion of Dignitas Germani, speaking on behalf of the entire Polish Bishops' Conference. What he were offered up a, an account of really why the council is recognizing everyone's religious liberty in a way that was new. And throughout his comments, he emphasizes the relationship between liberty and moral duty. That his declaration speaks of liberty of religion precisely because and in light of man's moral responsibility. He says that the liberty is large or maximal because religion, relationship to God, is of in Latin maximal moment of the greatest importance. And again, this is the part that I think we, commentators on Dignitas Humanae, American Catholics, Catholics throughout the world, have neglected. The moral duty and its overriding importance as the fuel or the propellant of the freedom from coercion. So let me say what I think is the most pertinent or relevant part, perhaps the most important takeaway, Dignitas Humanae, as we go forward in America and beyond. I think although there are threats are plenty to the norm of religious freedom, freedom from coercion. I think, and they're to be taken seriously and met um, as they ought to be where they crop up. But I think that the, the weapon that's needed in dealing with these threats to the freedom from coercion is an understanding of what that freedom from is for. And it is for each one's, or about each one's, inalienable moral responsibility, each individual person's moral duty to seek the truth about transcendent matters. You might say that there you have the kind of cultural substrate of the legal or juridical regime of freedom from coercion. The cultural substrate being anchored by two things, individual moral responsibility and the notion that religion is a zone of transcendent truth. Now, why do I think this is especially important? Well, let me try to explain in about one minute. You're far, fine. You're fine. You're okay, far, far as giving me the green light. No, you get, you get two. <laughs> Tom, truth well, Tom has made me especially comfortable by arranging this to look like our living room, or as if I'm on the Letterman show. <laughs> but if we go forward facing you know, threats to religious liberty from, let's say, a kind of communitarian right, 
maybe some Islamic countries especially, but not just Islamic countries, where religion is embedded in a social order where the kind of site of liberty, you might say, is still the community or even the political society, and where conformity to what others believe still is part of that society's understanding of its own political unity. But as we see in some places, then, a kind of social understanding of religion and connected with prevailing social practices and, you might say, unifying norms. But on the other hand, in America, I think the, the, the sort of trend is to greater individual liberty without an accompanying sense of responsibility and that in America the zone of religion is not so much a zone of truth, much less transcendent truth, but rather in larger terms within which religion, perhaps more properly understood, might find itself, is really a zone of identity or discovery, of establishing one's personality, of coming to grips with the person I am and establishing it and kind of announcing it to the world. So you might say on the liberal or left individualist side of the tendencies, you have the cultural ground of freedom of religion turning within to persons, where on the right you might say it's turning into society. And in neither case is there a firm cultural commitment to religion as transcending the political order. So I suggest that perhaps it's time, or it would be a good time, to mine, recover, and to propagate not the norm of dignitatis humanae so much as the, the sense of dignitatis humanae, that by locating its object, so to speak, religious liberty's object, in something beyond the political order, which is clearly what the document is talking about, you know, there's a much better chance of religious liberty doing the one thing that it really ought to do, which is limit the state to hold back Leviathan. But locating the object beyond political order will solve some of the problems or ameliorate some of the negative tendencies I've just described. And by emphasizing individual, individual moral responsibility, we can ameliorate some of the other bad tendencies or negative effects or negative trends. And I think especially in our own situation in America, we've come to a point where religious liberty you know, seems to have become merged with or subsumed by a wider personal liberty, which as the Supreme Court once said about 20 years ago, you know, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own sense of existence, of life, and of meaning of the universe. Now, this is a kind of voyage of self-discovery and self-assertion of establishing one's stance in the world within which you can find religious liberty, but it itself is not the kind of religious liberty that we see in Dignitas Humanae. And further, to Tom's great relief, I say if not. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. Terrific. That's a great start. Now, uh, uh, again, I want to get to to your questions, so get ready. We'll have a, uh, a microphone ready for you in just a few minutes, but I want to stimulate uh, a little more controversy than we've gotten so far here. Um, and, and I just want to spend a minute, and, and people can go further with this if they, if they like, but I suspect most people aren't uh, quite as interested in this as maybe, as maybe others are. But I, this issue of development of doctrine, each of you mentioned it in some way, and to, to non-Catholics and many Catholics, they probably wonder what this, you know, what difference does it make? It, uh, I believe Father O'Malley uh, said basically that it was, a, it was a break. Certainly it contradicted the popes, you said, and the best case, of, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, for development is to, is to say that it went back to the deep past to correct the present. Jerry Bradley quoted from the from the document itself, uh, saying, no, this, this is a development of doctrine. Well, what difference does it make? If, if it was a break with the past, uh, does, it, does it remove limiting principles uh, for, for what church teaching might be? Uh, or is there another way to approach this? Why should anybody care about it? Is that just sort of an, uh, an academic uh, quirk or a theological quirk? Father? Well, I think it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a very basic issue and it's basically how you look at the tradition of the church. And uh, that's uh, the thing we're all engaged in. Every theologian's engaged in that. And uh, the trouble with the, I mean, this idea of development of doctrine, it's a 19th century idea. Uh, John Henry Newman gave it his classic formulation. And it's extremely helpful, and it's, it's, it works for a lot of things. 
And a good example in the 1950s was, uh, even before that, was the development of Mariology, right? So one Immaculate Conception, then uh, the assumption, so forth, building on that, uh, so you see a, a continuity. But it does not uh, uh, answer all the questions about what goes on with our tradition. And one thing that goes on with our tradition, this idea of reform, a ressourcement, that is to say, going back to an older, presumably more fundamental tradition, uh, uh, principles and so forth, to correct the present. And so uh, you, you have to have both of those working. Otherwise, I think it's, it's uh, we, you, you don't do justice to the way the tradition has worked and should work, has to work as Lisa. human beings. Very good. Lisa? Well, I was just going to say, you know, to even talk about development of doctrine has to mean there's something new or there was no development. And it's got to mean it's in continuity with the past or it's not of doctrine. So obviously, it's both and. And I would just also emphasize, going back to the history that Father O'Malley gave of the document Dignitatis Humanae, the development of doctrine is very messy. Like there, there's no one set of criteria by which we can ascertain that this is an authentic development and that's not on, you know, sort of in a clear way on one occasion. You know, development of doctrine usually takes decades or even centuries, as in this particular case. Mm -hmm. And it, yes, it will be disputed. Yes, it will be contentious. That's part of the problem, or part of the reality, let's put it that way. Uh, Jerry, I want you to address this, but let me just throw into this that uh, this has relevance not just to the Catholic tradition, but, for example, to the Islamic tradition, which, which of course, as far as I know, has no theory, no Newman uh, uh, type theory to uh, articulate uh, points about development of doctrine. But some would argue, and indeed we spoke at this, about this a bit last night or yesterday at the Catholic University Conference, uh, that there's a need for a theory for Islam all, precisely on the issue we're talking about today, on religious freedom, uh, a theological and philosophical basis on which to claim this as a development of Islamic doctrine. So, so this isn't you know, just an arcane Catholic issue. It's important to real issues, uh, issues that we're dealing with in the world. But, but Jerry, I didn't mean to, to ask you about Islam, because I know you, you don't know anything about Islam. But Th thanks, uh, thanks, Tom. <laughs> please, uh, say whatever you think on, on, on this issue, because you do know something about that. Well, I think that. Um you know, many, many um, writers about Dignitas Germania, including Murray, um, and Murray writing in the mid-60s, would say that it's legitimate development of doctrine insofar as Murray and many others that I'm thinking of, but wouldn't mention by name, you know, really stressed um, the location of the teaching of Dignitas Germania in kind of modern circumstances or in present circumstances. And Murray would always use, not always, but it seemed like always, you know, use terms that stress the context in which teachings were announced and in that way, I think, not protecting, that's not the right word, but, but indicating that what's happening is um, the, the sort of changing of contingent teachings. And I think that there's a danger there of historicizing everything. And, and I think it's a danger to be resisted and, and a danger that can be avoided. But nonetheless, I do think that it's clearly the case that there's a repudiation, effectively, in Dignitas Shadimane of much that came before with regard to the public manifestation of non Catholic religions. Now, what is it that came before? Well, papal policies, the concordats that Father mentioned, even into the 20th century, papal teaching, theological opinion, respectable and otherwise, practices of Catholic states and rulers. I mean, all of that is effectively repudiated. What I, what I don't think is repudiated in Dignitas Humanae is anything that came before that was taught, taught by the magisterium is certainly true. And I think the heart Dignitas Shimani, as I mentioned earlier, is something that's always been taught as certainly true, which is that people have to come to the faith freely. Uh, and I think that there's a legitimate, and if legitimate's not the right term, an authentic, or if that's not right, a kind of continuous development of that insight, that ground norm, you know, in the tradition through to Dignitas Shimani, and as the document says, in, in, in present circumstances, given contemporary man's demands for recognition of greater or more of human dignity, 
this is the sort of new thing mined from the perennial. And the perennial is this perennial freedom. I just might say one more thing about the, the moral duty, the inalienable moral duty, which, as I said before, is not stressed enough. I mean, no doubt, um, you know, Dignitas Shimane says the state must give up on coercing persons. And it says that really in the first part of it. You know, coercion by civil authority is out. But the, they say effectively, of course, on the other hand, the moral duty of persons and societies to recognize the truth about religion remains. And even in the Gospels, of course, I mean, Jesus never is calling for anybody to be coerced, but Jesus condemned very harshly those people whom he thought should believe, but don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to call attention to on this whole issue of development of doctrine and what went on in Dignitatis Humana is the allocution of Benedict XVI to the Roman Curia in December, on December 22nd, 2005, in which he talked about a hermeneutic of reform for Vatican II. And one of his very crucial statements there is that uh, what is reform, and Vatican II is a council of reform, it's a judicious blending at different levels of continuity and discontinuity. And it seems to me that, in a few words, kind of hits the nail on the head. As you say, Lisa, I mean, there's, there, you, there's nothing really new. We're always in continuity with the past, and yet there are new things. And sometimes those new things come from repudiating at least the immediate past. And that's the thing what happens here with uh, basically a repudiation of ideas and principles that got especially formulated in the 19th century. And, mm. Okay, so uh, we'll leave this. I think I've teed up for anybody who want to, wants to ask the questions about the elephant in the room here, and that is, can reform, but I'm going to leave the elephant alone. I'll just mention him. Can this kind of reform lead to a change in evolution of church teachings on sexuality and marriage? Yeah. Uh, is there a limiting principle? Jerry's probably talked most about it. Uh, uh, that, that would prevent that. But I want to just take this briefly, and, uh, and we will get to questions from the audience in a, in a slightly different direction. And, and Jerry, I ask you this. You've written a book about the American founding. When I heard you talk about the, the duty, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, it isn't simply the, the freedom from coercion. It's the freedom to exercise the duty. It sounded a lot like James Madison. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering if Catholics are discovering something uh, from the from essentially a Protestant founding of this country? Are they reaffirming something that the founders of the country understood? And are, are they doing a very good job of, of reaffirming that, in your view? Oh, um, well, it certainly does sound like Madison, um, maybe most famously in Madison's Memorial and Remonstrance, which he composed, I think, in 1785. And it was a, a document uh, collecting arguments and articulating arguments against a proposed tax in Virginia which would be on all persons to support Christian ministers, basically. And at the very front of the document, I'll paraphrase from memory, but I think that the, the text is close to this. Um, the, the foundation of religious liberty is the duty which we owe to our creator, or to the creator, sort of semicolon. The manner of discharging this duty must be by reason and conviction not by force and violence. Now that sounds much like Dignitatis Humanae, and of course like Dignitatis Humanae, Madison there is not articulating you know, a, an extension of political theory to a particular area. It's not even a political ethic, but pretty clearly what Madison is talking about, and correspondingly Dignitatis Humanae is talking about, is the truth about God, the truth about religion, the truth about human beings. You know, namely that Religion is the kind of thing that you have to appropriate for yourself for it to be of any real value to you, and this is what God wants. So again, Madison is, is like Dignitas Shumani in that respect. Now, whether Catholics have discovered the founding or, or what, to, what to make of it, I don't know. Of course, Murray was a great student of the founding. I think that is not as careful or as informed a student as perhaps sometimes we, we think he was, um, but he certainly knew plenty about the founding. But I think he went to the founding especially not with the kind of historian's eye for detail, but looking for materials with which, which he could synthesize and thematize to sort of find in the founding a kind of proto-Catholic outlook. Uh, 
and I don't think I don't think Murray, as far as I recall his writings, made as much of Madison perhaps as, as he might have. And one further thing, I mean Murray, you know, through '64, well maybe through his entire involvement at the council, but through '64, the second and third drafts of Dignitas Humanae, Murray's view was in the draft. Murray's view being more specifically this, what he called juridical view, that mm -hmm. the main thing to say was that the state's incompetent in matters of religion. And that, I think, was maybe one of or Murray's main thing about yeah, church, state, and America. To, very you know, much objected to. Right? Yes, and that actually didn't make it, well, that's quite right. I mean, there was a great pushback, not only from conservatives, you know, so conservatives of the faith, but many others at the council. And it didn't make it to the end. It didn't make it to the ninth inning. But Murray's view about there being this incompetence and the Latin terms at the council, <clears throat> sort of ineptitude. Um, I don't think Murray was right about the founding in that respect, nor is it what Dignitas Humanae ended up saying. Um, it really ends up grounded in the truth about religion and, and ethics, rather than in, in a truth, so to speak, of constitutional limitations upon democratic government. Well, uh, Father, jump in here if you'd like, but uh, um, even if Murray did not uh, directly quote or adduce Madison. Didn't Madison also say in the Memorial and Remonstrance that this duty is prior to yeah. that of any, and precedent to that of any other duty in civil society, uh, which seems to me to be very much a limiting principle on the state and affirming the incompetence of the state, which Murray two centuries later affirmed. Okay. So here, I, I, I just hear these echoes in the American founding. Did you want to add anything to that, Father? No. Or Lisa on this subject? I have yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, first of all, I really liked your point. I was sitting there nodding, and I hadn't really thought of it that way, and it was a great point that there's actually a human value and a responsibility to seek to know religious truth, and that's one of the bases of the right to religious freedom. But I, I, so I had been talking about natural law, and something that came to my mind that goes back before Madison is that Thomas Aquinas, in his treatise on law and the question on natural law, it goes through various levels of existence saying uh, to, which is, to what ends or goods are these levels inclined. When he gets to humans, he says human beings distinctively uh, seek to live together in political society and seek to know the truth about mm. God. So it, it's not so much yes. that a certain religious belief is a matter of the natural law, but he just says all human beings seek to know the truth about God. And the, the one um, qualification, I guess, I'd make to what you said, or just to raise this maybe to discuss, it's not really a huge disagreement. But so you said that um, religious traditions, or Catholicism at least, and democratic societies promote this human inclination to seek to know the truth about God. And you uh, contrasted that to an individualistic view where the truth is found within oneself and a, a highly communal view where the political community is the locus of truth. And what I would just say is that, you know, to me I always find it better to try to find the value and the meeting point in other points of view. And I would say that individuals seeking to know the truth, like spirituality and all this sort of thing, like they do believe that there's a transcendent and they are seeking to find it. However, they're mistaken that they can find that only by looking inward because as Charles Taylor pointed out in his book, Ethics of Authenticity, we're all formed by communities and traditions. There's no such thing as a naked authentic self that has no social debt or no social formation. And on the other side, if you take a, a Muslim community or a you know, very traditional religious community of some type, it's not true that they think there's nothing transcendent. It's just that they identify that political community and its specific arrangements at that time with the only locus at which the transcendent can be encountered. And you're saying, no, it should be broader, which I totally agree with. But your, your basic point, I thought, was very well taken. Jerry, you want to? No, it's a good point. I mean, I, I, I mean Taylor's quite right and others have said that people don't invent them. I mean, we, we use yeah. the, the language and rhetoric yeah. of kind of inventing ourselves, yeah. but people don't. We're much more, we're cultural products much more than we think. I think that's true. And I suppose I, I yeah. should emphasize in that respect then the importance of having a culture supported in important but secondary ways by law, but a culture of 
everyone, encourages everyone to engage in the authentic quest and to be engaged. So a culture in which religion is understood to be a zone of truth mm -hmm. and in which people are responsible for the religious quest. And with, with regard to the maybe inward turn um, in our own culture, I mean, there, there, there's, a, I think, a real difference and maybe an unbridgeable difference between a view about what one's doing when one is engaging in a certain authentic search for identity and engaging in the search for the truth about the transcendent. I mean, it seems to me that believing or not believing that there is a reality out beyond what we can see and beyond temporal matters, that there's a reality, that the reality, the reality such as it is or whatever it is, is accessible in some manner, if only or especially when there's a God who's revealed himself or itself. So that thinking that I think is very different than thinking that what I want to be doing is establishing or discovering my individuality or my passion, et cetera. I mean, the two, I suppose, yeah. could overlap in some unusual yeah. case, but they're, they're two different operations, I think. And I think that we, we, we're tending towards thinking that the latter, the, ser the search for individual authenticity as such, as a kind of, as a, as a kind of terminal point for identity, is beginning to swallow, or has already begun to swallow up, you know, the search for the transcendent. But on the transcendent, Tom's quite right that even in Mar Madison's first paragraph, he uses a couple of phrases. One is the universal sovereign, and the other is the great governor of the universe, in referring to this God. So the God, that God, is not only out there and in, in some kind of communication with persons, but is actually interested in governing or setting norms, or is the source of norms. So that God is a source of greater than human norms and values. And if you buy into that view of what's out there, again, it's going to be different on the ground than if one is looking for one's own identity or discovering one's passions. Very good. All right, let's go to the, let's go to the audience. I know Jose has a question over here, wherever the mic is. Uh, we got two mics. Okay, let's go with Jose Casanova, and then we'll come over here, and then back to Roger. It's actually a comment, a reference to the last, the final paragraph of Dignitatis Humanae, which in a way points to this issue, not of development of doctrine, but the change in context within which doctrine has to be reformulated. Mm -hmm. And this is this new world we are entering of many religions, many cultures, the multiplicity of human cultures, which points to two other crucial documents of Vatican II, Nostra Etate and Gaudium et Spes. Nostra Etate, which is of course the document on interreligious dialogue with other non-Christians or with non-Catholics, and Gaudium et Spes, which is the constitution of the church in the world. It is because the world changes and it is in history that the church has always to reformulate its doctrine. And again, it is the experience of the uh, fathers of the council. If you compare Vatican I, in which 80% of all the bishops were Europeans and 20% Americans, and yes, mostly North Americans, a few Latin Americans, to uh, 1965 when the majority of fathers of the country were already from non-Western countries, means a new context for the global church, which understands its message cannot be a Christocentric or Eurocentric, Western-centric, but opening up to a new context. So I think this is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the, the context within which this dignitatis humanae has also has to be understood. Thank you, Jose. Father. Yeah, let me just uh, underscore something there, Jose, that I think is, uh, we've talked about development of doctrine. We've talked about, that is to say, this continuity. We've talked about um, resource small going back to the past. But also, the other feature of uh, dignitatis humanae, as well as other documents that you point out, is this uh, uh, attempt to, a giornamento, really, to your influence by the culture. And this is, this is important in the way the church operates, to sort of try to conform to that, to try to uh, get one's gears in that direction. So I think those three things are going on. And that's, Very that's good. Yeah. Over here. Hi, Leon Hooper from Woodstock Center. Uh, Lisa, first of all, um, uh, you were talking about um, bringing the utility of bringing uh, religious languages into the public forum and the uh, usefulness of that. There's one thing out of Murray's quiver 
that might be helpful for you. He did in the late 50s uh, make the argument that in the public schools, uh, teachers of the religious faiths ought to be teaching our students those faiths. What he was interested in was, of course, knowing what the other is about. But he was more interested in uh, people of faith being able to spell out the link between their own policy uh, choices and their deeper commitments. And this for the sake of public trust. It, it was for the sake of public trust that we ought to be able to bring our religious languages into the public forum. If we cannot demonstrate a link between a policy such as religious freedom and our deeper commitments, then we have to deal with that in the public forum. But yeah, it, it's, it's a demand that puts a lot of responsibility on those people of faith for, the, uh, for again, the level of public trust within a society. So uh, that, I think, would uh, actually draw us into further issues that uh, we will be talking about today. Also, Murray was not, of course, happy with the final arguments in Dignitatis. Uh, not particularly uh, that he was limited to uh, just the limitation of the state as, as a primary norm. He spent the last two years of his life trying to argue again uh, on the basis of social moral agency, the, the responsibility of us all to develop the deeper commitments within our social reality. Uh, and he attempted to ground that. One last uh, issue, uh, John and I, uh, you've been, we've been on this before. Uh, it seems to me anyway that Murray would almost argue, and this is working from your uh, notion, uh, Lisa, your notions of uh, the importance of uh, natural law for Murray. Uh, Murray argued almost to the point that uh, religious freedom, as we now understand it, as social moral agency for the common good and a conversation is a new revelation, that it isn't simply a, a return, the foundation of dignitatis is not simply a return to the past and a correction of the errors. It's learning something from outside the church in the contemporary world that we did not know before and he took this as even putting demands on the revelation that we have seen before. It, it, it is a viewpoint on the development of doctrine that has a lot to tell us about the pluralistic uh, religious environments that we are currently in. And, and where we look for the God in our future, as well as the God in our own past. Well, that's just Thank a very, very deep enunciation of the principle of aggiornamento. It takes it to a whole different level, dip, different depth, what you just said. Very good. Thank you very much. I, I, I told you you're going to hear a lot about Murray. For those of you who are not familiar with John Courtney Murray, he, he was not a pope. <laughs> uh, but he did have a, a great deal to do with the, uh, the, the issues that we're talking about here, and he's a very important arguably the most important American figure in our discussion of Dignitatis Humanae. I believe, Roger, you were next. Do you have the mic? Okay, we'll go back there, and if we could then come to, to Roger Trigg right here. Sorry, Roger, you lost the mic. Uh, sorry, uh, That's Kathy okay. Caveney from Notre Dame. Uh, sorry, of, could you say your name again? Kathy <laughs> Caveney from Notre Dame. Great, Far just want everybody to hear. Uh, my question has to do with the hermeneutic of interpreting Vatican uh, II, and, and as was pointed out uh, by Father O'Malley, uh, Pope Benedict has been emphasizing a hermeneutic of reform versus a hermeneutic of rupture. Uh, and part of what I think theologians and ethicists and interested people are trying to do is figure out exactly what that means in terms of the balance between ressourcement and aggiornamento. You know, certainly in terms of the liturgical reforms that we've had, we've seen more ressourcement and more emphasizing continuity with uh, the Council of Trent. 
I'm wondering, my question for the panelists is whether um, you see this emphasis on continuity uh, rather than the new moment, rather than reform in the area of religious liberty uh, as well. And, and one of the things I'm thinking of was an article, I think it was by Thomas Pink is the name, uh, in, in First Things, which was arguing, um, I guess lawyers would say, reading down the newness of Dignitatis Humanae, um, and arguing that the church does have jurisdiction to coerce at least the baptized, arguing in some sense that they freely consented, even though they were tiny babies, um, and that it can, but doesn't have to, it can delegate that responsibility to the state. To, to the state. Um, and right now we're not doing it, and we could do it. And, and, and that seems to me at least to be approaching almost sideways the old thesis hypothesis approach and and therefore not very much development and I'd like to hear what our distinguished any, and brilliant panelists have to say about that oh any thoughts on on this do I have to be distinguished and brilliant or can I talk no, but anyway you, you can go ahead and answer <laughs> have you read Pink's article in first things yeah well, okay. yeah Jerry um, I mean, Pink's, uh, you know, very provocative article. I mean, I, I guess his main thesis, well, as Kathy basically described it, is that we should read Dignitas Humanae jurisdictionally. It's, I'm not sure that, he, that Pink is asserting so much that's really what the Council Fathers were exactly trying to articulate, but he says this, this is the tradition going way back that the church itself possesses an original matter, and I guess by divine commission, I suppose, a right to coerce in the interests of faith, which, as Kathy says, the church for a long time with great frequency would delegate to the state or would request the state to execute, you might say, a coercive sentence that the church itself could, did rightly impose or a measure the church rightly enacted but wouldn't itself actually execute. I, I, don't, I don't think that's sound. Um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it surely is the case, and I think it is true that Dignitas Humanae, I think in this case, self-consciously steers around that coercion that's internal to a system of canon law and church householding maintenance, household maintenance. I mean, within the church, there are coercive penalties, interdict, excommunication can have temporal consequences. There are lots of things, or if you're if a church parish is closed and people want to occupy it anyway, I suppose the church can call in civil authorities to evict the trespasses. So the church has a certain internal coercive authority, which clearly is limited to those who buy into it. That is to say, in this view, the church's authority extends to those who voluntarily remain within the household of faith, and you always have the option of just going away. But there's that, that truth. I do think the council steers clear around that. Now, as to civil authority in the church, this, which is really Pink's thing, I think he's just mistaken. Now, Dignitas Humanae unequivocally states that all persons have this right against coercion by anyone else. It's not just a doctrine about civil authority, but that everyone, everyone should avoid coercion, manipulation, undue pressure, and manipulation, et cetera, of people when it comes to matters of religion. So it does seem to me that Dignitas Humanae on its own terms is articulating a human right. That is to say, there, there's an ethical, a moral duty on everyone to avoid coercion, manipulation, pressure, which corresponds to a right on the part of everyone to be free of that. And that's definitely not what Pink wants to say. So in Pink's view, there's the alternatives are a kind of jurisdiction-centered view and then a human rights view. And I do think the latter is not only the really the, the way to read Dignitas Humanae, I think it's you know, more firmly rooted, at least in a primitive way, you know, in, in embryonic form, in the tradition. And I, and I just don't think that the jurisdictional view has that much, I don't think it has legs. Very good, thank you. Roger Trigg. Roger Trigg from Oxford. Um, I'd like to just press the panel a bit more about some of the issues that uh, arose from what Tim is, Thomas Pink was saying. Because, of course, uh, we can all agree that Dignitas Humanae is talking about church-state relations. But what I'd like to ask is, how far did it involve a change in the view of the Catholic Church to its own members? And particularly if you actually do count membership as the baptized, which presumably actually, if you're strict enough, might include all Protestants. Because if you say, well, it doesn't actually involve any radical change, 
then you could still be justifying the Inquisition, apostasy, and heresy, therefore, are to be stamped on very, very vigorously. If you do, as Jerry was saying, respect the conscience of the individual in a very strong sense, the church should be standing back a little bit, even from the conscience of its own members. Now, as Pink says, I mean, this is more than just membership rules, because obviously if you belong to a community, you've got to abide by its rules. The church seems to be saying something a lot more than that to its own members, and particularly those who've, in a sense, been signed up to it on their behalf by godparents or whoever. So there are quite big issues about the relationship of the church and its respect for the freedom of the people who actually are its own members. I suppose another way to ask the same question is dissidents within, within the Catholic Church. Uh, Protestants, I mean, uh, Roger's asking a broader question, but does, does Dignitatis, in addition to what Roger says, well, does it address a, dissidents? Yeah, well, this is an issue that actually was one of the objections that the people opposed to the document raised, that it exalted conscience over obedience mm -hmm. and over discipline. And uh, so, in other words, the, the issue was there in the council itself but not resolved. So. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, I, I, your point is very well taken. Uh, you know, I think that made a lot of sense. I think where we come back to, though, is, uh, you know, if, if you can almost transpose that criterion of what is the minimal uh, restriction necessary for public order and the common good and so on, back internally to the church, and that's, a, that's precisely where people disagree. Like, how much, uh, disagreement, discussion, variation, and viewpoint within the church is consistent with the identity of the church and its teaching mission, and where has it gone so far that we just have kind of a random pluralism where we've lost our center? And I think, um, it, you know, uh, some people, I mean, I will come right out and say this on my own behalf, you know, I, I do think that there are... Um, central values within our tradition about sex and marriage, for example, about the economy, about war and peace. Uh, but I don't think that every particular um, detailed teaching of the church at a given time in history is necessarily indivisibly locked into that center. And the um, freedom of conscience, I think, uh, or, or and again, as you're saying, not just of individual consciences, but even of um, sites of Catholicism within the universal church. And so we could talk not just about the United States, but even globally. Um, you know, so there's, there's a productive um, pluralism, diversity, exchange. You know, I always think of the model of the New Testament with four different gospels written for four different communities, and they're not alike in every respect, but there's a visible unity. And so the struggle that we are always having is how much diversity can exist within a visible unity. And I just don't think there's, a, there's an easy answer to that. I definitely think that, as you pointed out, and I think expressed so eloquently, that there should be a, a, not just a right, but a duty to responsibly seek the truth um, that is part of our exercise of religious um, uh, vocation, even, within the church, and that it's internal, not just external. Right. Jerry, as you answer this, uh, it seems to me you and I have talked about this in the past, but Murray, whose, whose name has to be put into every discussion here, actually did footnotes uh, to the abbot. You don't have the abbot version with you there. I think that's Daughters of St. Paul, isn't right. it? The, the abbot version has Murray's footnotes in which he talks about this issue of freedom of conscience and what the dignitatis is saying it does mean and what it does not mean. Do you recall that, and can you incorporate that? Not well way? enough to speak about now, but you might. Um, and I, I do recall it, but not so clearly. He simply said that freedom of conscience is nowhere addressed in this document, right. uh, as it is often meant in modern terminology. And Father, you may remember this better than I. But that uh, it, it, it does not mean, and I think I can quote it here, that conscience means that I have the right to do whatever my conscience tells me to do simply because my conscience tells me I can do it. Right. Of course not. Yeah. So uh, he, here he, he attempted, I think, to, to express in a footnote a limiting principle. So yeah. respond to that. 
Thank no, I mean, Roger. I mean, that's quite right. I mean, um, well, Leon Hooper and, and many others present, including the other panelists, probably know better than I do, and in some cases, surely know better than I do, exactly what Murray meant, as you say. What Murray would, would say, did say, you know, this, this is, the document's not really about conscience, or it's not about freedom of conscience. I've always been a bit perplexed by that statement, um, to be honest with you. So I, I don't profess to have much insight into what Murray was thinking, but surely it is the case that it's a hijacking of dignitatis humanae by hostile forces to make it say something like that, that a conscientious judgment is sort of self-authenticating in, so, in that it, it's a warrant to do as one pleases, perhaps, perhaps minus tangible harm or absent tangible harm to others. I mean, that is a hijacking of right. dignitatis humanae for sure. It's, it's clear in the document. I mean, it's your, that, that is not the right. authentic interpretation of it. But right. the issue of dissent within the church, right. Jerry, did you want to address that? Yeah, and, and I think, well, I, I would. I mean, I, I, I think that Dignitatis Humanae, you know, doesn't quite, you know, get up to addressing the matter of dissent uh, because its, its addressees are really, you know, all people and especially perhaps states in the, in the world. So I don't think it speaks directly to the matter of dissent in the church, and I don't think it does so in any sort of significant way, inferentially or, or implicitly for that matter. What we need to say is that it's really about the sort of authenticity of the quest of each individual being free from coercion. At the same time, it affirms this moral duty of men and society towards the church and to the truth about Christ. Now, it seems to me, where does that leave one? I, I don't think that leaves one in any more lucid position, you might say, when one's conscientious thoughts, exploration, lead one to conclude, just for example, that something the church teaches as certainly true, you judge it to be false. Now, I don't think that the Natasha Money sort of addresses that situation, and I think it would, I think it leaves in sight, you know, whatever other learning we can gain from the council or any other parts of the tradition about that person, um, so the limits of legitimate dissent and where they turn into a kind of uh, well, either you know, heresy or schism or apostasy, um, I think that's left to other sources at the council, but not even so much at the council, but kind of other sources within the tradition. And I don't think Dignitas Shumani itself really gets aloft a case for, I don't know, what you would say, a kind of extravagant dissent um, so that one remains just as Catholic, even as one denies this truth, that truth, et cetera, you know, affirmed as true by the church. I mean, I don't think that's affected by Dindina Shumani. Lisa, yes. Well, I just want to go back to one point, which is not, uh, you know, an oppositional point to what you're saying, but it's a little bit different angle, I guess. And, you know, what the church teaches in the moral areas, which would have to do with the economy, war and peace, and sex and gender issues are, according to our tradition, grounded in the natural law. So church teaching itself should be defensible on the basis of, you know, to cite uh, Redemptor Hominis, human experience, the authentically human, reason. Uh, John Paul II says specifically, not purely religious arguments, okay? And this is where I have a big question or problem with some of the religious liberty rhetoric, as well as some of the arguments that certain things are taught certainly by the church, that they prescind from the attempt to defend and the necessity to keep in conversation about the ways in which these teachings are grounded in human dignity and the common good. And that's a bar that has to be met. We cannot just set that aside and simply resort to religious uh, authority, revelation, and uh, authoritative teaching because it is undermining the credibility of the public religious witness that we could otherwise have. Uh, so, I think that was a disagreement, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, at least a partial disagreement in this partial. way. And I'll, yeah, yeah, and I'll just try to be brief. I mean, I do think that at least in the moral area, leaving aside doc dogmas like the assumption and, yes, and the exactly. meaning of the Trinity, where you're not going to give too much of a rational account of what right. it means or how it could occur. But let's say in the area of social life and sexual ethics, I mean, I, I certainly think it's true that 
church authorities and, and Catholics generally ought to give it the, the best account they can of on natural grounds or reasonable grounds of why these things are true. Uh, and I think pretty much across the board, one can do that to a degree of cogency that's becoming, you might say, of the church. But I don't know if it's a disagreement, but the, the thing that makes the difference between a judgment, let's say that all innocent life is inviolate, or capital punishment's always wrong, or sex and marriage, but not outside of marriage, whatever the teaching in particular is, abortion's wrong. The difference between a judgment based on grounds of reason that those conclusions are almost certainly true, or look true to me, and holding them as certainly true is the Holy Spirit. I mean, I can't think of any reason why someone should take the view that on grounds of reason alone, you might say, one can be sure that this is not only true today, it was always true and always will be true. Maybe that can happen with some, in some cases, I'm not sure. But it seems to me that one ought to believe rather few things to be propositions to be certainly true, absent a guarantee, um, just stemming from Christ, that the Holy Spirit will keep the church on track. And that's not to abandon reason, that's just to, to say that the clinching reason, if you will, is authority. I mean, I believe because it's taught, and it can be completely reasonable to believe because it's taught. So it's not like blindly adhering to the authority, it's affirming that if the authority teaches such and such is the case, then that itself is a reason, and in this case, a clinching reason. Well, <laughs> look at this. I'm sorry, folks, but we are out of time, and uh, I, I depended on Jerry to do exactly what he did. This, that was a, that I think, sets the stage for much of the discussion that's gonna happen later on today. Uh, I'm very sorry that we couldn't get to all of you, but it's far better to end a discussion with people still having questions. But I'm going to call this panel to a close and ask you to give uh, a round of applause to our <laughs> participants. Thank you very much.